Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for choosing to worship with us, either in person or those of you who are watching along online. I'm glad that you've decided to take a few moments and to connect with God and His Word as we uh, open it together. I uh, do want to take just a moment here and kind of laugh about something that uh, Charles said during the introduction. When I was getting up, he said, or in the welcome, he said, oh, it's my boss. <laughs> I kind of laughed uh, because many of you, of course, had a chance to meet his boss last week. Uh, some of you had a chance to meet Dr. Pierre Steenberg, who was visiting with us from Union Adventist University, who is the guy who is going to oversee the program that brought him here to Casper and will ultimately be the one who gives him a grade. In fact, he's already provided grades and feedback on Charles's sermons, and I'll let you know, he did pass last week. Uh, <laughs> yay, he was nervous about it, but he did a, I thought he did a fantastic job. Uh, but it was, it was neat to get a chance to meet the guy who has helped him through some of his schooling. He was the professor who's in charge of many of the practical classes for ministerial students. And, uh, and I hope that he's learned many lessons, either through Dr. Seenberg of what to do, or of course, things to say, well, that was helpful in the past, maybe I'll put my own spin on it, and then find out he actually didn't know what he was talking about. Anyway, um, <laughs> You know, how, you know how young pastors can be. Every once in a while, young pastors can be just a little uh, excited, creative, energetic, and uh, get out and, and try something different or new. Read about it in a book, read about it in a blog, saw some other pastor do it on, on social media and said, I should try that too. And that's one of the reasons I am glad that pastors do still continue to maintain accountability, not just to their congregation, but to their bosses. Some of my kids will know that I have a boss. Uh, kids, do you know who my boss is? Besides mommy. <laughs> Who's, what's my boss's name, kiddos? Mickey Mallory, that's right. We have a fantastic ministerial director here in the Rocky Mountain Conference. Uh, our ministerial directors, if you're not familiar with the concept, as I've basically come to understand it, they are the come on, load, pastor to the pastors. It is their responsibility to provide support, encouragement, and uh, just to be there for pastors throughout their journeys. I've had a chance to work in 15 years of ministry with two fantastic ministerial directors. Back in Michigan, I had a chance to work with Elder Royce Naiman, who was not only the pastor who was able to be there to support me through ministry and to even do my ordination call about a decade ago. He was the pastor who married Andrea and I. Uh, it was 19 years ago, earlier this summer. He was the one who dedicated one of our children, I believe it was Hannah, no, that was, oh, I'm losing track now. I know Bob Stewart was involved in one. Bob is also a ministerial director at Michigan. Bob and Royce, and uh, I think Chad did Holly and Hudson as well. Was that Dan Tower? I'm losing track. We'll sort this out later, you guys. We, <laughs> we'll get back to you. But it is nice to, to know that when you're going through these hard times, to know that you're going through ministry, that you have people who will be there to support you and encourage you. And the reason I bring this up is because uh, just in the past week, I've had a chance to receive a few text messages, and, uh, or just the past few weeks, I've received text messages from Mickey Mallory, not only checking on my, my understanding of new technology, because he doesn't just teach, he's willing to learn too. We had quite a discussion about AI-generated sermons. Because that's something that pastors are now uh, wrestling with. How do we use AI tools? In fact, the Bible software that I use to generate those word searches that most of you guys have already finished, that's done by Logos Bible Software. A couple of weeks ago, Logos very proudly rolled out AI tools for sermon preparation. And so we had quite a conversation about, can you be a pastor who uses an AI-generated sermon? And so we talked about what that meant. But he also talked to me about perhaps something more, more urgent, more pressing, more important. A couple of weeks ago, he definitely gave me the weather forecast, wanted to know how we survived the snow. And I said, oh, you know how it is up in Casper. We'll get it, and it'll be gone in a couple of days. Not this time. I thought we were still in fall. My mistake. Uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> 
But I will say it is nice every once in a while to get a message of support and encouragement. And I'm thankful to all of those who reach out to me with support and encouragement, as I have had the chance to do with Pastor Charles while he is working with us here in Casper. And I hope he knows that I will continue to be a place of support and encouragement as he goes through his ministry. Now, of course, you've caught on, you picked it up right away. You know that we are now transitioning in our series where we've been studying Paul's writings this fall. We are now transitioning from letters to whole groups of people to the letter written to a specific person. We are reading the first of Paul's letters to a specific individual. Yeah, there is no town known as Timothy that received a a letter from Paul. This is a person. As we get into our message of uh, Paul's encouragement to one of his students in 1 Timothy, what we've come to realize as as I've read through this book several times, the encouragement that Paul is giving to Timothy, the support, the lessons, the uh, knowledge and insight from experience and wisdom, and of course with much prayer, what it all boils down to for our message for 1 Timothy is simple. Is, Dear friends, stay focused on Jesus at all times. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this chance that we have to be able to gather together and worship you. Lord, as we've sung songs and heard stories, and now open your scriptures, Lord, I just pray that you'd speak to us and help us to listen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles, of course, I want you to open to 1 Timothy, but we do need to put a little bit of backstory into this this particular uh, epistle when we're getting into it. So while you're opening to 1 Timothy, let's talk about who Timothy is. Some of you may be faithful Bible students and be aware of the fact that he is not one of the 12. If you've had a chance, for example, to watch The Chosen, there wasn't an episode so far that includes Timothy yet. He was not one of the 12. In fact, he came into Paul's life a little bit later in Paul's ministry. We see it mentioned in Acts chapter 16. It seems like we've gone to Acts chapter 16 quite a bit in this series. Do you remember who else joined Paul's group in Acts chapter 16? Just a couple of verses later. Luke did. That's right, the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. So we see in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 1, it's described, uh, Luke's writing here, he says, Paul went first to Derbe and then to Lystra, where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was Greek. I'm sure that didn't lead to any controversy. (laughs) Now, I have to admit, I've got a bachelor's in theology and a master's in divinity, And including in that is an emphasis in New Testament studies. And even I had to stop and say, now, wait a second. Where in the world are Derby and Lystra? I'll help you out. They're right there. (laughs) Now you're like, wait a second. What is that that I'm looking at? So let's zoom out. Let's make sure that we all understand the Mediterranean. Make sure that we're all on the same page. What is that country up in the top left corner, that boot that's kicking that island off across the sea? That's Italy. Across the sea, then you run into those, that island that's just kind of breaking off into the Mediterranean. That country is Greece. And then there across the, the sea, now you have that, that larger peninsula, modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia Minor. And there in the midst of that, we saw Lystra and Derby. That is where Timothy was from. Now, we see that Paul picked him up as a part of many of his evangelistic ministries, of, of his missionary trips. Uh, not only had a chance to plant churches in several of those communities, but we've had a chance to study several letters that he wrote in reaction back to those churches as he gave them ongoing support and encouragement. As he did not just say, all right, well, I've taught you everything you need to know. Good luck. I'm praying for you. You got this. He continued to follow up with them as well. Sometimes they had it all together, and they just needed a little encouragement. Other churches, well, God loved them too. (laughs) So now we're into Paul's ministry just a little bit, and we know where he met Timothy, but we also happen to know the occasion where he received this letter. We know that Timothy was in one of these communities, but does anybody know which one? Well, if you've had a chance to open to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and maybe do a little bit of skimming, you may have noticed that he's actually in the city of Ephesus, right there on the coast of the Aegean Sea. 
Uh, we know that it's Ephesus. It says right there in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, when I left for Macedonia, the northern part of Greece, I urged you to stay in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Now let's do a quick recap, a reminder, because it's been several weeks since we studied Ephesians. Let's talk for a second and make sure we understand what was the church of Ephesus like and what did they have to deal with. We know that Paul sent them a letter, and the letter had the easiest outline of any of them that we've studied so far. It's simple. It's six chapters. The first three of them could be summarized as simply, God is awesome. And then chapters four through six is an appeal to the Ephesian church, but also to all churches, to let God do awesome things through you. So that was the message that Paul was sharing with this Ephesian community that he himself helped plant and establish as he spent upwards of three years ministering to them. As he then left, but sent encouragement back, now he's now had to send Timothy back to them. (sighs) Question. First Timothy is likely written a couple years after Ephesians was written. Do you get the sense... That when he planted them and he spent those years with them, he thought he had it all together, but he's now had to send a letter and then send a student pastor back to them. How do you think they're doing? How much could have changed in just a few short years from the time that Paul planted the church to the time that Paul wrote his epistle to the time that now he's had to send one of his student pastors to go and check up on them? Well, you heard it. Verse 3. Why did he have to go there? It wasn't because this church had it all together. In fact, quite the opposite. What did it say? I sent you there to stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. They are now dealing with false teachers and all sorts of interesting heresies, all sorts of different approaches to the gospel and God's word. But that's not all. In fact, if you were to look at just a a quick glimpse of some of the issues they're dealing with, you had false teachers, and he deals with them in chapters 1, 4, and 6. We had disputes between the church and the community. This is 1 Timothy chapter 2. We had disputes for the struggle for leadership and authority in the church and at home, chapters 2 and 3. We have infighting between different groups within the church about who should receive care and attention. That's chapter 5. This church is falling apart from within and dealing with issues from outside coming at them. This church is in danger. But this isn't something we should be surprised about. We knew that this church was going to face struggles. The only question is, how are they going to respond to them? What is the church of Ephesus going to do when it goes through hard times? What is God's church going to do? What are God's people going to do when they come under attack? Are they going to lean on him, his strength, and his teachings? Or are they going to crumble? Unfortunately, we know what happened at Ephesus. Because the Apostle John also had a connection to this group. Jesus sent a letter through John where unfortunately Jesus says flat out in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. I have this against you. You don't love me. You don't love each other the way that you used to. Modern tra- or, uh, traditional translations will talk about how you've lost your first love. It's heartbreaking to know what this church would eventually fall into. But just because the church is headed that way doesn't mean that God is ready to give up on them. Think about story after story of person in the, of people in the Bible whose life seems to be headed the wrong way. But then God gets a hold of them and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of their heart and changes their lives before it's too late. This is what's happening here with the church of Ephesus. Timothy is being sent to this community to save it. But what does it mean for a pastor to be in charge in leading a church back from the edge of destruction? What is Timothy's role in this church? Is his job to just come in and say, all right, well, you have a problem with making sure that everybody gets enough? Timothy, I want you in charge of the community services program. Hey, Timothy, 
Uh, there's some dispute with the, the uh, local public officials. Timothy, I want you to come in and be the public relations officer. Timothy, uh, the church is kind of crumbling a little bit. I want you to be the deacon of the building committee. In fact, when we do our entire nominating committee report, Timothy, you are coming in to be every position out there. You are the professional. It's your job to fix it. Because that's what the church needs is a professional who does all the work for them. Right? <laughs> Notice what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4. His encouragement, his first words to him after, this is why I sent you here, was to keep them in line in their teachings. He says, don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations, and they don't help people live a life of faith in God. Don't let them be distracted. Don't let them waste their time. Don't let them get caught up in meaningless speculation. Keep them focused on moving forward and upward. Keep their eyes on God. Keep the church going forward. And the reason that he wants to start with this is because not only does the church of Ephesus have to deal with it, but he knows that there are other churches that deal with this as too. There are things happening all around us that will seek to distract us from our goal, that will lead to endless speculation, that will lead to infighting and distraction. The devil delights in us chasing the world and chasing our own tails. A perfect example of this even shows up in what I've had to deal with uh, on my, as a part of a group that I, I'm a part of, Adventist Professional Ministers Group. It's a group of fellow Seventh-day Adventist pastors. You'd probably be shocked to know that the number one issue on the minds of many American Seventh-day Adventist pastors is what message do I preach in response to what happened on Tuesday? When we talk about the election, when we talk about how the results went, what message do I preach in response to that? Be and the reason that the pastors are talking about this is because I can't help but wonder how many people in our congregation are also wondering about how the church is going to respond to the election as well. Do we see the election of Donald Trump as a positive thing or a negative thing? How are the church going to rally behind Donald Trump? And I'll tell you right now, my decision as a pastor is not to rally behind any American president. My king sits on a bigger throne. And so if you sit here and you perhaps wonder, not just with the pastor, but with others sitting in the pews with you, you might have been sitting in Sabbath school or sitting in worship and looked around and saw somebody else sitting here and wondering, did he vote for her? Did he vote for him? <laughs> That's the exact type of distraction that the world wants us to have. When we spend all of our attention and energy worried about something that happened last Tuesday rather than worried about a day that's coming soon, that's when Satan wins. When we take our eyes off of the heavenly kingdom to get so focused on the earthly kingdom, that's when the church becomes useless in being an agent of God in this world. So how should we respond to that? Interestingly enough, when I planned this series, I just happened to notice, I, I, it was not intentional, that we would be running through 1 Timothy. You know how Paul, what Paul has to say about this issue? Pray this way, chapter 2 and verse 2. Pray this way for the kings and all who are in authority, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved, and to understand the truth. And so the encouragement that I'm seeing in here is not should we be wrestling with, did he vote for her? Did he vote for him? The question is, did you pray for her? Did you pray for him? Because we know that regardless of who won, Democrat or Republican, they need God to guide them. Neither party has it all together. I know one allegiance that I can follow that does have perfect truth, though. And I hope that both sides would listen and be led by him. Neither side has it all together. And this is something that was admitted in our scripture reading. I want to thank Gary for reading this one. Uh, it, it's just that when you say it out loud, it can just come across tough, 
This is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience and even, or with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. If God can have mercy on me, he can have mercy on you. If God can have mercy on Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, or, oh yeah, we have another guy currently serving as president that we haven't talked about very much as a nation over the past couple of months, that Joe Biden guy, they should all be a part of our prayer life. Because if God can do something through them, if God can make an impact through them, and no matter how the campaign season went. We know that Donald Trump's not perfect. We know that Kamala Harris isn't perfect. We know that Joe Biden isn't perfect. We know that Michael Taylor isn't perfect. But man, if God can love me, if God can love them, he can love anybody. And this to me was especially mindful because some of you know my testimony. Some of you know that I spent half of my life as a devout atheist, somebody who fought against Christianity, argued against Christians, made it my goal to make Christians cry to wrestle uh, with their thinking, to, to uh, embarrass them in, in classes and in public places. And here I stand today, a victim of prayer. You may look at them on the left or them on the right and think that they're too far away. Nobody is too far away for the love of God to come in and change their lives. So what are we supposed to do? Not get caught up in all of their squabbling and all of their fighting Press them to something better. As I was prayed for because I had somebody who wanted to see me in the kingdom, pray for them also so that there will be plenty more victims of prayer that will get to hear their story one day. That's the encouragement. Keep them focused, Timothy. Keep them moving forward, Timothy. Keep them moving upward, Timothy. What does that look like? Paul says, Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 18, Timothy, my son, hear my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ. Keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences, and as a result, their faith has shipwrecked. They've lost sight of forward. They've lost sight of upward, and they've become shipwrecked as the New Living Translation puts it. He encourages Timothy especially to be somebody who is known for his integrity, for his determination to be faithful in all that he does and says. Because when you lose sight of God, you lose sight of the purpose for all of this. Dear Timothy, keep them focused forward and upward. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't occasionally take time to to deal with difficult situations, to deal with things that are going on in the church or in the world around us. And so the book of of 1 Timothy has to deal with issues that the church was facing. We saw earlier the church has many of them. But how does Paul counsel Timothy to deal with some of these issues? Well, as I understand it, Paul uses timeless principles from the Word of God as the basis for his timely applications. He's dealing with specific situations, dealing or that are uh, facing certain people in certain communities at certain times. And so he takes the timeless word of God and brings it to the people in their day. One issue that Timothy was having to deal with in Ephesus shows up in chapter 3. I want to use this one as an illustration. You may be familiar with the teaching, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. A bishop, an overseer, an elder, a leader in the church that must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, etc., etc., etc. There is one particular phrase in here that you know will lead to a fight. What's that phrase? Where's the fight? Husband of one wife. If you didn't know that there's a fight that shows up in there, you haven't been on the internet. Bless you. (laughs) This is a a fight that our denomination has been having for quite some time, and not just our denomination, but many Christian denominations. What does it mean to be a leader 
And you see this line in here, husband of one wife, and there is a lot of debate and speculation about how to interpret and apply that. Is it a rule? Is it a recommendation? Or is it something else? What do I mean by that? We have, for example, a couple of interpretations. Some people just look at that and see clearly that leaders must be married. A hu- must be husband of one wife. A few verses later, it talks about how their children must be under control and, and well taken care of. Therefore, all leaders must have children as well. Surely, right? Another interpretation that has popped up is simply says, if they are married, they must be faithful. Husband of one wife, monogamy, not polygamy. In a pagan world, in a pagan culture, where polygamy was was pretty common, stand out as different, be a faithful husband. In fact, that mindset is how the New Living Translation, one of the more modern translations, the one that I preach from, uh, chose to interpret or translate this passage. Uh, So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. Exercise self-control, live wisely, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the correct way to deal with the uh, statement here when he says that we should have leaders who are husband of one wife? And you'll notice here that even this translation that, that says faithful to his wife, people will see that it must be a man whose life is above reproach. Do we take it as a literal man, as in male, or a generic man, as in human? If we were to take it as a literal man, as elsewhere in Scripture, we may start to run into issues, I'll note. Anybody here familiar with the fourth commandment, the reason why many of us are here today to worship on Saturday? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days shall you labor and do all your work, and and all those things. Notice in verse 10, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. It doesn't mention wife, she says, because Lynette, being a good student of biblical Hebrew, recognizes what it says, in it you shall do no work, you, the you is masculine, singular. You, men, nor your son, nor your daughters, and uh, none of you can work. The only one who doesn't get a Sabbath, if you want to read into it a literal interpretation, is the poor wives, the poor mothers. Now, the joking response that comes out of that is, I've heard some people note, that God must know that if women ever stop working, the, church, or the, the world really would fall apart. That is one reaction to it. But dealing with some of these issues, some of these conversations that we've, we've wrestled with of what is the role of women in, in ministry and in leadership, reflecting on this, James White in an 1861 article in the Review and Herald that I don't have on the screen, but he simply notes that the Bible talks about how if a man falls away from God, a man will die. Well, cool, women are immortal then. <laughs> and that's James White's reaction to this. We must be careful when it says man to not automatically just group it down to it must be male. Because uh, much as I, when I used to wait tables, would walk up to a table with seven ladies and say, hey guys, how's it going? Sometimes there are words that, um, that, that could have broader meanings than how we simply literally want to use them. My kids know that sometimes I've not only referred to them as a dude, but I've referred to my water bottle as a dude. This is what I say sometimes when I get frustrated. (laughs) So going back to a passage like this, what are the principles at stake here more so than the word-for-word application? The same thing even applies if we go to the previous chapter. When Paul says, I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. (sighs) I hear you laughing over there, Tracy. I think you just broke Paul's commandment. (laughs) Now, one of the interesting things, of course, is when we have this conversation about let, don't let women teach men, man, our church school would be in trouble with this entire female workforce. Most of our Sabbath schools, and especially the children's divisions, would be in trouble. 
if we do not let men or do not let women teach young boys. In fact, I would love to see grown-up men take over some of our, our kids' programs. <laughs> Gentlemen, kindergarten. <laughs> oh. In fact, Paul in his own ministry demonstrates that this may not be as hard and fast of a rule as we sometimes make it out to be. Because go back to Timothy. Go back to his own experience. What were his parents? His mother was a Jewish believer. His father was a Greek. What do we know about his mother? Well, this is fast-forwarding a little bit, foreshadowing for next week's sermon. But Paul talks about how, speaking to Timothy, I remember your genuine faith because you have the same faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that that same faith continues strong in you. You were only here because of the teachings and faith of your mother and grand grandmother. Where your dad was not the spiritual leader in your household, your mom was. And you were now bearing the fruit of that. And so if we want to go back and read into 1 Timothy chapter 2, a literal, thus saith the Lord, that there is, there is no place for women to be a, a spiritual leader or even a teacher. And by the way, another thing that we, we look at is translations are interesting. There is actually quite a debate of or have authority over them. Another common interpretation and translation of the Greek is to usurp authority over them. And that may have been the actual issue that Paul was fa- or Timothy was facing in Ephesus. That women were coming in and causing chaos because they were already prominent and established faces in the community. And now they've come in and now they want to be established in the church community too. Because just a few verses later, he noted that they were wearing clothes that were putting everybody else to shame. They were obviously wealthy. They were obviously well-established and had some sort of reputation and naturally drew people to pay attention to them. People were following the outward, flashy leaders rather than the ones that God has called up. And so in that way, they're usurping authority. And Paul's like, hold on a second. Let's make sure we've got things in the proper order. Proper order is a major concern for Paul in his teachings of how to manage a church and how to manage worship. He doesn't like distractions, disruptions, or other chaos. He doesn't like them getting caught up on other issues that distract being uh, anything away from Jesus. There we go. Another thing that we'll note when it comes to Paul's own example in ministry, Paul worked with females in other towns in leadership roles in their situations. We had, he, he noted Phoebe and Hunia in Romans chapter 16. He noted Chloe in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in fact, the first half of 1 Corinthians is because of reports that he had received from Chloe. He had worked side by side with Priscilla and Aquila as they've traveled in their missionary journeys. And by the way, going back to the conversation of a leader must be the husband of one wife, look once again at Paul's own experience. Paul notes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that he was a single man. And he sometimes wishes that everyone could stay single like he was. Do you happen to know another leader of the Christian church who was never married? Oh yeah, the the big guy, Jesus. So when we talk about some of these rules and we read through them and just take them at face value and don't apply any thought to them and apply any context to them, we start to lose sight of what that means as Christians. And of course, the Seventh-day Adventists, it gets even more awkward because arguably the most important leader in the history of the Adventist church was a woman. A lady by the name of Ellen White has once been named one of the top 100 most influential women of all time. She held no official offices or titles. But countless Christians have followed her life and teachings to get to know Jesus better. It's interesting, of course. Like I said, she had no official offices. She had no title. She, she had a, a significant impact on our church, but was never world church president. Didn't have a title, but was still a leader. <laughs> I mentioned Ellen White, and I mentioned the impact on her ministry I do simply want to put out a note that if you want to know more about not her life, but the life of Jesus who she wanted to point you to, 
I've got plenty of these books called Steps to Jesus. I'd love to give you one to help you get to know more about how to impact your relationship with Jesus because that was her goal. The, the blessing of Ellen White's ministry to our denomination was to simply be one who would be a, a mile marker, a signpost, that GPS to point people forward and upwards. And in fact, she said in one of her closing remarks, one of her closing addresses to the General Conference, that, that I commend this book. Oh, I'm sorry, not this book. I commend this book to you. You don't need steps to Jesus to get to know about Jesus. You need a Bible. If you don't have a Bible and you're here today, I'd love to give you one of these. I'd like to give you one of these, but I'd love to give you one of these. Because if you have this and you read it, and you're ever focused on forwards and upwards, you don't need this. But sometimes a starter guide is a good place to, to get your, your conversation started. Anyway, as we continue to work through First uh, Timothy, we find that throughout the rest of the book that Paul, in other places, uses timeless principles as the basis for more timely applications. We find that Paul continues to have to speak to the situations. You remember all the, all, all the craziness that was going on in the Ephesian church at that time. So it boils down to principles like don't be an unnecessary distraction to the church or the community. Only take your portion and make sure that others who have needs get their portion too. That's how chapter 5 boils down. Be as faithful in your home as you are in church. Be as faithful in your work as you are in church. Of course, choose God and his ways. He pushed them to ever choose the timelessness of God and his word and his character. And so what did he want Timothy to do? To simply come in and keep them focused on forward and upward. So dear friends, the encouragement that Paul has to Timothy is the same encouragement that Paul has to each of us. Stay focused on Jesus at all times. And one of the things that I found that I love, if you do this, if you stay focused on forwards and upwards, if you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus. You'll be one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching that you have followed. So my encouragement to you all is to also be a good servant. Ah, yeah, I see people moving. They, they recognize the key word. The appeal to be a servant of God. Sometimes what it means to be a leader is to be led. But as you go forward, like it or not, if you stay faithful to God, people will notice. They'll notice that you're different, and they'll want to follow. It can be a hard life sometimes. It can be a challenging life, knowing that people are paying attention to you all of a sudden. But I hope and I pray that when they follow you and they see you, they don't see you when they don't follow you. They follow Jesus, the one that you're willing to serve. Our closing song today is a beautiful chorus, Make Me a Servant. <laughs>